right. Amen. Thank you, Meredith. All right. Well, welcome, Adult Sunday School class. You know, the Sunday after the revival is just like, you know, I come up and it's like, man, you had Brother Beck, Beckham all week and Brother Rich. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. So I want to go ahead and... Uh, just give you a disclaimer. So we're going to, as we as we jump into the book of Revelation, um, we're going to start, I'm, I'm going to just slow down a little bit with the seven churches of Asia, because I felt myself, the last time I was just kind of ripping through them. And, and you know, when people think of Revelation, the book of Revelation, they think of just the destruction of the world and all that. But the first three chapters of it are geared towards the church. There is no destruction. There is no anything in Revelation, but two chapters on the church. Why is that? Because of the destruction that's to come. There's a lot of focus on the church and how a church runs, and we are the ones who are going to get these people out of the fire. So he, he, God calls John on the island of Patmos, and we won't go through John a lot, but he says, hey, I want you to deliver a message to these seven pastors, these seven stars of these seven candlesticks, which we shared last time, are the seven churches of Asia. And each of these churches characterize what a church is supposed to be and what a church is not supposed to be, as we looked at a lot of the condemnations already. And in each, each church, there's a description of Christ that goes with that church. And um, this is not dogmatically, that I, this is not dogma, but there's a church period that these churches are related to. And as I studied them, I can see this. But why spend time on these seven churches? Because it is the church that, that needs to keep these people out of the revelation. It is us. It is our soul winning. It is our, it is our tent activities. It's our knocking on doors. It's our testimony at work. It's what we are as a church. You know, people drive by. I, I was talking to a guy the other day about a church and what church are you? And we're protecting. Oh, he says, I know you guys. Again, I see you're always doing stuff. It's that. It's the churches. It's, it's picking up people for church. And so he, he delivers seven messages before the destruction. He says, wait a minute now. Before I, I lay out what's going to happen, let's lay out how to prevent it. And it's to my seven churches. So we started, and, it, and it, it's true. It's, it's us. So he starts with the church of Ephesus, and I'll just recap a little bit. Does anybody need a fill-in sheet? Okay. He started, and I'll just, re, I'll just, I got, I think, to the third church, but we'll go ahead and just recap a little Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a good church. They were a well-favored church. But he says this. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And we went through this two weeks ago before Brother Beckham, and, and the, the main thing I want you to get there is how do you leave your, your first love? And that's generational. When, when Ephesus was started, they were on fire. Now, this is about 30 years after, and now they're a second-generation church. Not so much on fire. The key is, for this church to be successful, Ricky's generation needs to be on fire. And now I have an Adriana. And then her generation needs to be on fire. That's how we don't leave our first love. See, they were starting to step. They were still a good church, he says. But they were starting to step back from what they loved the most. And that's Christ. You know, we, we have the motion going on here. Man, we are a working church. We are a serving church. But is Christ still your first love? Now, now um, well, I, I, I get yelled at for pointing people out all the time. But I was going to point to a second generation Christian. All right? Is... is Jesus, your first love. See, I got saved out of the fire, man. When I got saved, I w man, I was, I was in the muck. And so I appreciate my salvation. But, you know, now I have kids. And now my kid has a kid. Who is, Lord willing, going to grow up in church? Is she going to understand the value of that salvation of our first love? And they were starting to leave that, okay? He says in verse 5, he says... Remember, folks, that's what we got to do. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. All repent means is just turn around and look back at what you, where you're at. 
Just look back. You know what? Just kind of look in that mirror. Man, I remember what I was. You know what? I don't want to be that anymore. Just look back. Repent. And, and do the first works. Or else, he says, I will take away. I will come quickly and remove thy candlestick. You know what would be a shame? If the candlestick of Patuxent Baptist Church ever was taken away. I believe we are a light. I'm not saying we're the best. Yeah, I do think we have the best church. I'm sorry. Well, I don't think we're second best. I'm not being prideful. I love my church. I do. I don't. I'm not going to go out and say, yeah, we're, we're all right. Maybe we're not as good as, no, I'm not, I think we're a great church. I'm not being pompous or prideful because I know we can fall. You know, but I love my church. I don't want this candlestick to fall. You know, I mean, I'm getting slightly older. Um, I'm not going to say that to anybody else, but I'm going to need somebody to take over for me in about 60 years, right? So then he went to Smyrna, the church of Smyrna. Smyrna, Smyrna, I call it Smyrna. All right, that's your fill in there. And, and the church that was poor yet rich. Now this church was going, now they were a tribulation church. They were a trial church. They were going through it. Um, I won't go through all the things I went through last time, but he says this, um, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Um, I know thy works. You know, God knows what we're doing. He does. He knows what we're doing. He knows where our hearts are at. Um, you know, he says in verse 8, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. You know, Christ went through it. You know, when you think of trials and tribulations, I cannot get the fact, I cannot get out of my mind, the mountains are God's. That just, that, I've always looked at the mountains, but I've never, ever in my mind considered that, that, because we always hear the mountains, are the, the mountains, and, but they're still gods. Wow, that's really good. And Christ went through all that. Who here has ever been beaten severely for being a Christian? That didn't sort of antagonize <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> but not the sense I'm talking about. Who here has ever been beaten to almost to death? Okay. Who here has ever been crucified? Who's ever been, well, you might have been spit on. But who's been really tortured for being a Christian? Nobody. Okay. Christ has. He gets it. He says this. He says, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Um, but he's alive. He's alive. So he, he's talking to the church that was poor yet rich. Okay, then the third church, the Pergamos church, the compromising church. Um, so let me go ahead and go back to this one. We'll, we'll just kind of start here because this is a big thing. Um, Hang on, just bear with me one minute. I'm going into the big book here. So we're going to look at the Pergamos church. All right, the compromising church. When we examine the church of Pergamum, we learn the vital lesson of religious compromise. I believe one of the greatest weapons Satan uses against the church is the weapon of compromise. The lesson we should learn is that as Christians, we should never compromise our faith ever. Um, now, there's some things I want to say, but I got to be careful how I say them. Um, well, I'm just not going to say that. Verse 14, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, no, notice that key word, hold. Well, I will say it. I, I'm a sheriff chaplain, okay? And sometimes I deal with other, uh, of other, other faiths, other churches, okay? Now, that's not necessarily a compromise. But if I start, because we do a lot of things for the community and we do things for the people, and, but, but if I start walking with things I disagree with just to be part of them, that's compromising. You can be friends with folks. You know, like I have, I have some Catholic friends they are just great folks, you know? But you don't compromise your beliefs to do what they do. That's my whole point. Okay, you should never do that. Look at verse 14. He says, because thou hast there them that hold. Now, that's the key word. They hold it. They hold the doctrine of Balaam. Verse 15. So, hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Okay. Again, he says, I know your works. He says, I know what you do. 
um, their commendation. He says, and, and you have not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr. Okay? And he says this. He says, who is slain among you where Satan dwelleth. He knows where you're at. He knows you're in the world, okay? He held fast to Jesus' name, but he says, I have a few things against you because you hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. You know, when you study Balaam, at first he looks like a pretty solid guy. He, he says, no, I can't do that. And this bad king Balak says, I want you to curse them. I want you to curse God's people. He says, nope, I can't do that. So he goes back and they go back and forth. He says, okay, I want you to curse God's people. He says, nope, I can't do that. So he goes to God, what do I do? And, and you know, he should have just got away from that mess. He should have gone in his, should have gone on his donkey, the one he talked to in the first place, and just said, okay, let's just go. <laughs> let's just get out of here, man. And I think he kept going back is because he, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I think we want God to say yes to the bad things. You know, Lord, I have five cigarettes left in this pack, and then I'm done. Should I smoke those last five and just... And there are people that do things like that. Lord, I just... The Powerball, Lord, is 18 trillion gazillion dollars. Can you imagine the tithe off that? Well, I guarantee if you're not tithing off your paycheck now, you're not going to tithe off 18 quadrillion gazillion dollars. You know what the tithe of 18 quadrillion gazillion dollars is? 18 bazillion dollars. Right? If you're not tithing off of your paycheck, which is probably not that much, you're, I doubt you're going to tithe off of that. Okay? Anyways, my point is, do you need to pray about that? Um, I think sometimes we, we want God and we convince ourselves that God wants us to do things we know he doesn't want us to do. All right, so compromise. Um, when a Christian compromises his faith, now understand this. Why this in the book of Revelation? Because when you compromise your faith, you help nobody not go into that. The, remember, think about this. Why did the churches, why did these messages come before chapters 4 through 21? Because God doesn't want people to go through chapters 4 through 21. Well, 21, yeah, because that's heaven. Okay, 21's good. But up to that, right, Brother Carter? God, hey, I want you seven churches to get on the stick because chapters 4 through 20 are going to be hell on earth. I don't want people to go through that. And the ones that are going to stop people from going through that are you. Right? But if you compromise... And you give in to things, you're not going to be that church. And oh, by the way, they are no longer a church today. Um, the doctrine of Balaam, he could be bought. Um, he, he put a stumbling block. You know, when you compromise your faith, you become a stumbling block to those you're trying to win. All right? And look what he says. Here's the counsel. He says, repent. Again, with that word, repent. And you know, repent simply means to just turn, turn around, turn away from it. Turn, just get away from it. That's what it means. Um, or else I will come quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He says in verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. You know what? Was it? I just did a study recently on manna. <laughs> or, or was that part of Brother Beckham? Did he talk about manna? And how much manna they provided? Is that him? Okay. It's funny how you blur things in. The amount of manna they got every day was amazing. For like a couple years, like the whole time in the wilderness. That's a lot of manna. Anyways. So, but I will give to you the hit, to eat of the hidden manna. What is that? That sounds pretty good. And we'll give him a white stone. Here's a challenge. The blessings of God if you just overcome it. All right? All right. So let's, let's roll on. All right, and this is, I think, where I left off, actually. The church with the Jezebel, Thyatira. That's your fill-in, Thyatira, T-H-Y-A-T-I-R-A. -A. Can I ask a question? Who here has ever read Re Revelations 2 and 3? I imagine everybody has, okay? Uh, who here has ever really studied Revelations 2 and 3? Okay, good amount of hands. I believe that's an important book. A lot of people just kind of, in my opinion, I think a lot of people, hey, Bob, Bobby, how you doing, buddy? Pretty fuzzy there. Amen. 
a lot of people seem to just rip through that because I want to get into Revelation. But that is the book of Revelation. That is the revealing. Jesus is revealing, hey, I'm revealing a lot of things to you. First of all, let's, let me reveal to you how to be a church, how to be a good church so you can keep people out of that bad thing. You know, so, all right, Thyatira, the church with a Jezebel. All right, the letter to the church at Thyatira represents an old yet modern problem. Um, they were permitting a woman to teach and seduce weaker brethren to submit to practices foreign and forbidden to God's people, okay? And God's saying, hey, let me show you some things on this, all right? So their commendation, he says this, he says, um, well, he says, these things saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. And if you were here for my last lesson, the flaming eyes represent God's judgment, okay? Those you know, when we see Christ, we're going to see this Christ, the one with the flaming eyes, the feet like brass. You know, those are some judgment eyes right there, all right? Um, and his feet are like fine brass. He says, I know thy works and charity. They had charity and service and faith. Thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. You know, he knew their works. He knew what they were doing, okay? He knew their faith. But in verse 20, he says, notwithstanding... I have a few things against thee. You know, you think God's in heaven saying, Patuxent Baptist Church, I know you. I know your works. I know your faith. I know your love. I know your soul winning. I know what you do. But I have a few things against thee. Could that be said about us in heaven? <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, the reason why these seven churches come first it's because it is now the church age. We are not in the revelation age yet. We are not in the tribulation period yet. This is the age that keeps people out of it. So I, I'm, going, I'm just saying this, and I'm getting this now. You know, the older I get, I get this now. That's why he was so tough on these seven churches, because it's you. You are the last line of defense. Okay, tribulation, church. You know, you got to go through the church age why not be saved and do it the right way and be on the other end of that spectrum? When I'm raptured out of here, I don't go through the tribulation period. I go to heaven. I'm with Christ for the, 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 the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then I come back with Christ on, a, you know, in Revelation 19, verse 9, that's when I come back. I bypass all that. That's why there's so much emphasis on these seven churches. Let's get people to bypass that. But I have a few things against thee is not going to help us. He says, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Okay? Now look at, look at the key word here. Thou sufferest her. You allow it. Um, so I just have some things here. Um, number one, women in the church. I think it's a great thing. I think women should be in the church. That's all I'm going to say. Let's go on. <laughs> now this particular woman though, wasn't just a woman in the church. She was... Uh, the wrong kind of woman in a church. She was causing troubles, okay? She was teaching people the wrong thing, and there's a spirit of that. You know, today, a lot of churches, and you know, again, I try to be very careful how I say this, but we are a male-run church, which I believe is biblical. And again, that does not cast anything against the women of our church because we would really not function well without the women of our church because they're workers. They're not Jezebels. This is a different kind of woman. I have seen women run churches before. I, case in point, I was in Norway long, long, many moons ago in the Navy, and, uh, and my wife is still mad at me for going to Norway because of something that happened there. I was, okay, let me ask you a question. Okay, so your wife's back home making a military move, or, well, whatever, and moving into a new house, and she's got a two-year-old little girl, and you're in Norway, and you're supposed to, there's only one, we didn't have cell phones then. So, I, she said, call me tomorrow at 4 o'clock. 
He said, I'll be at the new house. It's the only place we had a phone. Well, that morning in Norway, the guy said, Young, we're about to go climb a Norwegian fjord. You in? A fjord. Have you ever been to a Norwegian fjord? They're like mountains in Norway. Pretty cool, right, Brother Ray? Wait, call fjord. Okay, let me ask this. Who would have picked a fjord? All the men. <laughs> Who would have called their wife? Come on, Brother Mike. You are compromising, and I just preached on that. Well, I chose the fjord, and it was awesome. Well, it wasn't awesome when I got home. She said, you said you are going to call. And it was terrible. And nothing worked right. Everything was breaking in the new house. She, she needed help. So, I couldn't have helped her anyways, but I was supposed to call her. And, but I brought you home things. I brought you those little Viking dolls. Anyways, when we were in Norway, though, um, I, I, I was trying to find a church. And we were in this really nice hotel in Stravanger, Norway. It's really cool. And uh, so I found a Southern Baptist church. I said, awesome. So I called them. I said, hey, can y'all come and get me? And they're like, sure. And this guy picks me up and takes me there. And I get there. And there's this dude and about 15 women. And then this lady starts, just starts leading the whole thing, does the whole story. I'm just sitting there like, are you, are you going to preach? I'm like, there's, no, no, we don't preach. We just talk. And she led the whole thing, and I'm just like, that's terrible. I was about to just get up and say, listen, sit down, let me preach, you know, but I didn't do that, you know. Um, but my point is, it was definitely a lady-led church. Now, again, I'm not busting on ladies. Ladies are super smart. But there's an order on how things are done. And in this particular case, um, this, the Bible says, this woman, okay, which calleth herself a prophet, Tis, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things. This was the wrong kind of woman, okay? And we could say the wrong kind of spirit, the spirit of a Jezebel, all right? Um, she was called a Jezebel because of her characteristics, okay? Like the Ahab's Jeze Jezebel. Um, but if you look at verse 21, and, and again, I, I just not gonna, I don't want to spend a super amount of time on this, but God, in verse 21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. You know what? Again, if there are things, here's the thing. The, the Bible says that the church suffered this, that, or they allowed it. I believe that word, that's what that word means, is they allowed it. And that's not just for the Jezebel thing, it's for everything. If there are things... Um, you know, for example, let's just say the Bible I held in my hand was a, a New King James or an RSV or something, and Pastor knew about it, and he said, all right, just go ahead, Brother Rich, it's all right. Who's at fault, me or him? Because he's allowing it. Now, I'm wrong for doing it, but he's my authority, okay? So my point is this. They were allowing this. That's why sometimes, you know, like, you know, for example, I... I Today, I, I have something I need to do for the, the tent thing coming up. And before I did it, I went to pastor and said, hey, I'm going to do this. Are you okay? Well, I'm planning to do this. Are you okay with that? He says, yeah, that's good. I do that because he's my authority. And I, I want to make sure that he's not allowing something wrong. That's important. That's why we have authority. Okay? So that's the church with a Jezebel. We don't want to be a compromising church. We don't want to be an allowing church where we allow the wrong thing. We don't want to be that. Then, the church of Sardis, the church that did not know that it was dead. Now, I preached a message on this about probably about a half a year ago. Does anybody remember that? That's okay. I don't remember messages too much. You were gone. That's why I preached it. <laughs> you, were, you weren't here, Pastor. <laughs> That's why it was on a Wednesday night or something. That's why I preached it, because you weren't here. <laughs> but I appreciate that. Amen. Is that lying in church? or is that... We're going to allow that, though. <laughs> The church, now think about this. The church, how do you not know that you're dead? How do you not know that? You know what that's called? A zombie. This is a zombie church. A zombie is dead, but don't know he's dead. That's why he wants to eat you, okay? And, and that's exactly what this is, the church of the zombie. That's exactly what a zombie is. It's still moving, but it's dead. 
And there are churches that are like that, right? And they don't help you, they eat you. <laughs> I'm not, I didn't mean for that to be funny, but it's exactly what they are. They're zombie churches, all right? We see it's still a functioning church, okay? He says, um, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and thou art dead. They had a name. They had a marquee out front. They said, come and join us for fried chicken and sing some songs. They have a marquee, okay? Um, the message was to jumpstart a dying church, to save what spiritually they still had, all right? Um, he says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name. Um, there are a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. I know thy name. He says, but you're, you're dead. So they had a name. What does that mean? You know, there's a lot of, and again, I, I know we're being watched, so, but there are a lot of churches out there with names that inside are filled with spiritually dead people. You know, if, if I had a save o meter in here, and I could, you know, you know how like in the nursery they put that thing on your head, beep, 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 tells you if you have a fever. If I could had a machine that could tell if you were saved, how cool would that be? And I believe if I put that machine on your heads, I believe that probably 99% of you are, would probably go positive that you're, you're saved, okay? That would be great, but I don't know that. But in a lot of these places, that machine would go cold. Listen, folks, a church is made up of saved people, okay? I don't want to just be having things. I don't want to just have clubs, to just have clubs. And they had clubs. They have probably Awanas. And they have activities and soup kitchens. A lot of these types of churches have soup kitchens. And they help a lot of people physically. Um, but what are they doing spiritually? They're, they're spiritually dead. But uh, 1 Timothy 5, 6 says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. They were alive. They were functioning. God had not yet removed their candlestick, okay? They still had hope, but they were dead. Many, now let me just share this with, with, with modern day churches. A, modern parallels to this church. Many feel that large numbers reflect spiritual life. The bigger, the more people in your church, the more spiritual you are. Is that true or false? And that is so false. Okay. Um, all right. Some folks think that if you're a small church, you're not growing spiritually. That's not true. I know of a lot of churches that are just in tough areas. You, you look at Brother Ward in Japan. Brother Ward has been there for what, like 108 years. Brother Ward's been in Japan for, I mean, I've been in this church 30 years almost 30 years, and he was there before I got here, so he's been there at least 30 years. I think he runs a total of, what, 12 people, 15 people in his church? Well, he's not doing very good. No, he's in a tough place to have a church. You know, he's got to learn Japanese because he is, in, he is not in a Navy base area either. He's, not, he's in Kobe, I believe. He is not by a Navy base. He is in the heart of Japan, and the only way you're going to talk to people is... No one Japanese, okay? You know, when I was stationed there, I learned just a few key things in Japanese. And basically, they're, well, I'm not going to say what they were, but, but, well, I'll tell you, it was how to ask a girl out on a date, how to get her phone number, and how to find a train station. So I didn't get lost in Yokohama, okay? That was it. But you got to know Japanese to witness to people in Japan. And in all those years, he's got like 12, 15 people in his church. But I believe those people are saved. You know, he said, man, he's not doing, very, he's not very productive. Yeah, he kind of is. Because I don't believe his church is a dead church. It's a living church. It's a functioning church. It's a serving church. And when somebody joins his church, it's because, you know, people there don't just kind of go to church because that's not what they've been taught. You know, they're, they, they're in the, the family worship and all that. And so for somebody to step into a Baptist church in Japan, that's a big thing. But to get saved, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of fruit. I mean, that's big. So I say the equivalent of 15 people is like a mega church in Japan, you know. So some people feel that material wealth and fancy buildings reflect spiritual life. You know what? Listen, I love this building. I know the rugs. I look at those seams, and I, I, I know they bother pastor, but they bother me too, you know. 
But I love our building. You know what? I love my office. You pick on my office, but I like my little office. But, Brother Rich, if you were a you'd have a bigger office. No, because we don't have the space. It's what you do with it, you know? Um, many people feel that, um, um, well, just there's a lot of things. But, you know, this was a dead church. I don't want this, not the, that was a dead church. I don't want to be that. He says, repent. He says, look at this, in, in 2 Timothy, he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know, I guarantee you, I know pastor preaches right stuff. I know he does. You know, and pastor has people that come in, like Brother Beckham, that preach right stuff. We continue that. That's how we stay alive. Amen? And we just continue coming to church and serving God and loving the Lord and doing right and soul winning. That's how we stay alive. Okay? Then the next church, and I wanted to finish this today, but I'm not going to be able to, um, is the Church of Philadelphia. Now, I love this church. Um, I love the story of how Philadelphia got its name. And so I'm going to read this to you. There's... What is, what is the name of Philadelphia? What is it called? What is its nickname? The city of brotherly love. Have you ever been to Philadelphia? <laughs> it does not reflect its name. It's the city of brotherly, stay in your car, lock the doors, and drive through it as fast as you can. Because my wife is from that area, and when we drive through Philly, we lock our doors and drive as fast as we can. Okay. However, well, we did stop once for cheesesteaks, and that was pretty cool. All right, this is an interesting piece of history, okay? The, the king, um, it, okay, so there was a king, King Philadelphus, okay? Or, no, wait, that's not right. There was a, a, Lydian, a Lydian city founded by King Attalus II, or Philadelphus of Pergamor. This is, a, uh, he was given the title of Philadelphus by his brother and predecessor, King Eumenes II of Lydia. This is awesome, all right? Um, because of his loyalty an admiration of his older brother. Twice his brother could have stole his kingdom from him. He could have betrayed him. But because he loved his brother so much, King Attalus named the city Philadelphia out of love and respect for his brother because he loved him so much. And that's where he got the name brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia means, is the city of brotherly love. Okay? And when you study the church of Philadelphia, it was that kind of a church. As a matter of fact, when you read this, and, and we're going to be done right now. We're going to continue this next week. But when you read about this church, there is no condemnation that I, that I know of. There is no condemnation given to this church. It was a, church, it was a, it was a soul winning church. It was a missions church. It represents the, the missions age, actually. And it's a fantastic church. We'll go ahead and pick that up next week. We will finish the churches next week, and then we'll get into, uh, after that, we're going to look at the, the sign of the time, time. Signs of the times, okay, from Matthew, even though it's not Revelation, but it's important to understand that, both what it means in Revelation and what it means now. Um, I have, you know, a lot of people ask me, I have like one minute, they say, Brother Rich, do you see us coming out of everything we're in right now? And I used to say, yeah, we're America. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to bounce back. I don't say that anymore. I'm not trying to scare folks. You know, all these shortages and things. I'm just saying, know you're saved. Hey, we might bounce back. I mean, I mean, you know, it's just stuff. But, but it's not just that we're shortages on everything and we're short on workers and everything. There's a different kind of spirit in America. There's a, uh, you know, I, I'll bring up Abby for a minute. She constantly tells me about people she deals with. And she says, Dad, a lot of people are just mean. Have you noticed a, tr it's sort of, have you noticed people are just more on the mean side, just snap at you, snap at you quicker for, for nothing? It, there's a change. So I don't know if America's going to bounce back. I, don't, I, I pray for a third great awakening. That's my prayer now. Yes, I don't want to run out of pizza, but <laughs> I'd rather there be a third great awakening. I really do. And maybe shortages and troubles and high gas and, and a collapse in certain things might just... That might be what God's wanting to do to get...